final, it's like a truncated uh, panel session. Again, a uh, panel session I've not done it before, but I thought it was ideal for, for this. And if you're really involved just in Wikipedia, you're thinking, who are these people? And if you're involved in open education, you're going, wow, look at this panel, it's amazing. Uh, so I'd better introduce, <laughs> um, uh, introduce the panel first. I'm me, um, I'm just at the intersection of uh, the open education resource with Wikipedia. We have Amber Thomas, whose job title is Program Manager for Digital Infrastructure. Which is, so digital infrastructure doesn't mean just having uh, broadband that's fast, but actually the infrastructure to support learning in the future and the big picture of the national, um, how teachers will take place, and what technologies will be using, and what the kind of things, how to get remix culture into, yeah. Yeah. and it's something, how to get remix culture into education, it's something she reflects on in mailing lists and her blog, and uh, if you go to open education resource events, you see a lot. Um, Sarah McCullier is um, the runs Durham, service manager Durham. If you don't know Durham, Durham AC UK, it's the national archive of uh, educational resources. For open education. It was the oh, resources, and then there was a, an option you could have open resources, you could have Creative Commons license, but more recently it's gone completely to Creative Commons, it's entirely open. Um, and it comes in open formats. Um, uh, and your, so if the librarianship and curation of learning materials, anybody dealing with that accounts as you in some way. So <laughs> how people can find, uh, yeah, yeah. Can I ask you a personal question about your qualifications to be oh, a librarian? Oh, I thought we were going to have time for this. <laughs> <laughs> well, um, well, one colleague here might know what I'm talking about, I don't know if you're old enough, but um, the only qualification I have on paper is an obscure New Zealand library qualification that no longer exists and is no longer recognised. And uh, I've been publishing academic papers and working in higher education in the UK for the last nearly 50 years, fairly successfully. And I feel like that plus my librarianship side gives me a bit of a different perspective on the idea of the sort of open education world that we're moving to. I am not sort of really locked into this higher education as the way the truth of the light. <laughs> Fantastic. But there are many ways to become educated. Right. Terry McAndrew here is an advisor for Tectis. Tectis is a national advisory body for accessibility. So he tells people about their websites and their learning stuff about if it's excluding or including different types of use. Is that fair? Yeah, but, but we, we are a pedagogical bias more than a technical bias. Right. We're not telling people how to meet the standards. We're helping people meet an accessibility need by advising them on appropriate use of technologies. Right. So, so Joe's got a background in teaching statistics and supporting bioscience education and is the editor of the German teaching Yeah, bioscience. produced bioscience education in right. German. Yeah. And you're also a mighty northerner, so you're really handy to have. Uh, uh, Absolutely. Yes, great. Right. <laughs> right. <laughs> and lots of Wikipedia uh, perspective on that actually you know, exactly what it's a mouthful that you want to be. So can I ask Anne first to give like an opening so you know where we're coming from, the position statement. I'm going to give you a whistle-stop tour about the, uh, the types of openness that you can find in universities. Um, so, as Martin said, I work for GISP, which is uh, a UK-based, publicly funded organisation that supports university, universities and colleges um, in the use of technology in teaching, learning and research. So, that's GISP. And we do a huge amount of work. I'll get a chance to say a bit more about it tomorrow. But for now, this is the whistle-stop tour on openness in universities. My starting point, the, the sunlight, is it comes from the idea of the freedom of information legislation um, in the states that they call the sunlight laws. So, you know, we're talking about Wikipedia, but this is a little bit WikiLeaks. It's the idea of using openness to flood light into, into new areas. And that is something that's happening in, in a lot of universities at the moment, and certainly in the sphere of academic communication. So opening up access to information, data and processes floods sunlight into areas that were previously hidden from public view and in doing so it also nurtures growth. And there's some things that are changing, that's the kind of things I want to talk to you about. In terms of what openness means, how many people recognise the five stars of, uh, of, data, of open data? Ah, so open data is, um, <laughs> is to do with putting out materials that were previously <coughs> locked up, but making them available in such a way that people can rework them and use them. Um, there's been a big initiative in the UK um, and in the US and, and overseas 
in other places as well, um, to open up government data in particular. Um, so the, this is the idea that there's different sorts of openness, from just making stuff available and free, through to making it available for very structured reuse and all sorts of um, other purposes. And so we've been having this a very live discussion about this in terms of open education and open educational resources. And this was um, uh, Peter Reed, who's at Manchester Metropolitan University, picturing different sorts of openness around this. So access, as in can you get to it, is it free? License, what are you legally allowed to do with it? Software, can you actually get to it with free software or cheap software? And format, how long down is the format? And, and interesting relationships between software and format, and there's a lot of discussions take place around that. Um, funnily enough, I've come up with some very similar conclusions, and I'm going to use this kind of uh, thing through my whistle-stop tour of types of openness to try and demonstrate that there are those different dimensions. Okay. So, this is going to be really fast. I'm going to talk about all of these things very quickly. Open data, making data available for public access and reuse. We've got things like data journalism, some national libraries making their collections available as open data so that you've got open bibliographies, people can link to books, even if they can't get the book, at least they can link to that, the details about that book. We've got the World Bank has made a commitment to making its, its uh, economic social uh, data open so that academics and NGOs have access to it. Um, key information sets is, is a big issue in the UK universities because that's to do with the sorts of decisions that students need to make about choosing universities and there are open data approaches to that. Open standards, as in non-proprietary, there's a whole load of standards that are particularly relevant in the education world. Things like IMS standards which are used for transferring particularly content packaged um, ed educational materials between virtual learning environments, learning platforms and so on, through to um, standards around metadata sharing like Dublin Core and uh, a whole load of specialist open standards there as well. But the key being that it means that lots of different developers can, can use them to build systems that talk to each other. Open source, I'm assuming everyone knows what open source means, um, but in universities there's actually a real growth of open source approaches to developing their systems and that's really interesting as well. Open innovation, which is interesting in terms of working in, in a wiki way, it's often more about the process than the product and there's lots of examples of that happening in universities as well. That's where crowdsourcing and public engagement comes in, partnerships with, with businesses. Open scholarship, I get to talk about a lot more tomorrow, um, that's different ways of doing research, different ways of sharing research and different ways of academics talking to each other in, in more public ways so that they, there's a wider space for that uh, conversation. Open access, which is in terms of having free copies of research papers that anyone can access outside of the paywall and GISC particularly has invested very heavily in an infrastructure to allow that to, to happen. Um, open content in terms of openly licensed content and uh, put things up there like the Khan Academy. Who's heard of the Khan Academy? And who's heard of the OU's Open Learn? And who's heard of Jura? <laughs> <laughs> uh, right? And we particularly we, we run a program um, in, in the UK uh, specifically to support open educational resources development. And I think this is my last slide. Open education we get to. Um, and this actually links very much with the, the last speaker about these different models of delivering learning opportunities. And in that space we've had the uh, Wiki Educator doing the OERU, which is a collaboration of universities using OER approaches to provide uh, free online courses. There's MOOCs, someone mentioned earlier, which are a different form of online, free online courses. Um, and a whole host of um, examples where people are trying these different methods. So my summary is that although you can't necessarily tell from the outside yet, there's a lot of things changing in universities and it's, I think it's really useful to be looking in the right spaces and be looking at things like digital humanities and e-science to find out where the rich content is that Wikipedia can link to. Fantastic, Cheers. thanks very much. We'll have the opportunity to ask you questions. Also the questions come up from that, but I'm first going to ask Sarah to... I've been so clumsy all day today now. I'm very excited. I don't know what's wrong with me today. <clears throat>
Thanks. committed to it and it feels very tangential to what the people that are involved in Wikipedia are doing um, but through listening to everything today and reading the handouts and things um, I feel that we're all coming from the same place and this is uh, something that I learned when I did that obscure library course 25 years ago um, I remember being a um, anarchic 21 year old punk uh, who went to the course because the library I was working for made me do it and came back buzzing with this idea that I'd found something that really meant something. And what it, what it was about was that quote that you guys use for Wikipedia, to open information to everybody on the planet, all the sum of human knowledge, which is what public libraries and academic libraries have been about since they started. So I feel like we're part of a really long trajectory. We're not something particularly new. And I feel like Joram very much is about that, just as much as Wikipedia is. Um, and maybe we're succeeding in some ways and we're failing in others, but we're certainly working very hard towards that goal. So I will try and whisk through as quickly as I can. Um, so we're not supposed to be talking about content, and uh, Durham's pretty much about content. Um, so I just thought it would be useful today to ask the question, um, given that we are infrastructure in the same way that libraries are infrastructure, how can our infrastructure provide data to assist with building tools and applications support, inform, and enrich open educational practice. I haven't got loads of time to go into any of this, so it's just food for thought. So Joram's a national and UK level open educational resource service to UK higher and further education. Uh, it's all Creative Commons licensed content. It's around 15,000 OER at the moment. Um, but anyone in the world can see it, download it, and use it. Um, so just thinking very quickly about what motivates people to share their content um, instead of just putting it on a website, maybe giving it to Joram or maybe using Wikipedia or one of the other initiatives you've talked about. Well, in the, at the very start of today, um, it was someone saying about what really excited the students about these assignments where they make a Wikipedia page is the number of people that then look at it, the hits, the views, the feeling that you've made an impact, and it's more than ego, it's about feeling like you're making a contribution, I think, um, and that people are recognising that, which is just a very human thing. And what motivates people to seek uh, OERs or other open content? Um, well, they're only going to put effort into it if they're pretty sure that they're going to find something reliable and something that is of use to them. I, I like the phrase that someone used earlier today, information overflow. Uh, I'm subject to that. So, oops. Uh, just to briefly touch on another sort of facet of what I'm about to talk about is the UNESCO guidelines for open educational resources and higher education had seven um, potentials, I suppose. The first two are improving the quality of learning materials through peer review processes, which is something I'm sure you're all, I mean, that's a lot of what we've been talking about. Um, but also reaping the benefits of contextualization, personalization, and localization. Um, now, Taking content and sharing content and making content available uh, for the 15 years of my career, um, these doing these two things, making these two things happen with that content, um, have been some of the biggest, most frustrating challenges that we've tried to attack from many different angles. Um, so, the questions I'm thinking about today are: How do we understand the impact our contribution is making locally, nationally, and globally? How do we know where to seek content ideas and tools of acceptable quality for our context? Uh, and how do we improve the quality of our content, our practice, and our learning? So I'm going to talk about collecting, sharing, and understanding data about context, conversations, and curricula. Uh, and this is touching also on the open data that I'm, I'm always talking about. So, uh, apologies to those involved in humanities disciplines that already had the word paradata, but we've stolen it. Um, 
We are currently using the term paradata to refer to all that data around learning resources. Uh, that's about the usage of activities around learning resources, for instance, social media shares, commenting, and so forth, and curriculum data in the sense of how people are using it in their local curriculum. Um, those are the kinds of things that feed into those needs that I was talking about earlier. Um, you need to know how things are being used, where they're being used, what do people think of how they're being used, what do people think of them, your peers, what do they think of them, what does someone on the other side of the world think of it, um, does it match my local need, how do I know? All this data is complex to gather and complex to understand. Uh, so, coming back to these challenges, uh, over the last year and a half or so, there's been a US-based project called the Learning Registry, uh, which aims to enable capturing and sharing data about how and where teachers and learners use resources and what they think of the resources, which we call Paradata. Um, it's still a very technical and experimental project. I can't send you off to a URL and you'll be able to tap in the URL of your resource and find out who's using it. It's still very much a sort of under the hood kind of project. Um, but it's got an active international community um, and we in the UK are part of that community. Um, at MIMAS, where I work uh, on Joram, we've also got a project called the JLearn Experiment, um, which is doing the sort of UK investigation into this. Um, the other thing, you can say that the Learning Registry is a community, you can also say that it's a notional technical infrastructure. Um, so it's trying to look at new technical ways to make this happen in a decentralised, open way, rather than saying, I know, let's build a big repository that will hold all of the usage data. It's more about how can we all set up our own nodes to collect and share our usage data, so that if there's something in Durham that's also on OpenLearn, that's also in some other repository in the United States, how can we gather all of the activity data wherever that resource is and pull it together and pull it back to that one location where you're looking at it. So you can see, for instance, 30 people have used my resource in the UK, but 25 have shared it from OpenLearn and somebody else has left these comments in the US. That, that's the kind of idea. I can't point you to anyone that's doing that now. <laughs> it's really it's just food for thought. Okay, so the daily experiment is our, our project, which is nearly at an end. Uh, Durham and the Daniel Experiment represent two ends of the spectrum. <coughs> Durham is a formal funded service um, which has real users that really need the paradata and the usage data. <coughs> Daniel is the experimental project. Um, Durham and all of our users want to understand the impact of OER shared via Durham. So we have at the moment a formal service enhancement project underway to collect, store and openly expose statistics and other paradata about OER shared via Durham. Um, and there's a link on my last slide that you'll be able to follow to find out a bit more about that work that's going on and to keep an eye out on what's happening because we'll be rolling out um, sometime between now and Christmas uh, so that you'll be able to not only see stats and data about resources but access a dashboard that makes it really easy to access the stats um, through a number of mechanisms by subject, by institution, by author and so on. Um, but there'll also be open APIs so that people can programmatically get the data out and expose it however they want. Um, but Jordan's also working with the Jalen experiment um, just as part of that short term exploration. And there's a bit of stuff about that on the Jalen blog as well. So I don't actually have any big conclusions or anything, I just wanted to throw all that out there and tell you the kind of things that we're thinking about to try and uh, enhance how we can make content and an educational practice work a bit better together by sharing this kind of data and understanding it. Thanks very much. I hope that makes sense. Tony, do you want to start with you see the open education problem? Okay, my open, my open education issue. My open education issue is making it all a little bit more accessible um, because um, we could put a tech this website up there, um, which might give you some ways into how we tackle this, if you're in tech this. But if it's going to be open, if the future is more open, it's not just the geographic open, it's not reaching people in, in the darkest parts of Africa which have just met the internet. It's actually making it open to people that are already within our society who are actually accidentally becoming denied um, access to more and more educational materials as it gets more and more digital. 
because it's very easy to accidentally design out the group. You know, people who are hearing impaired or visually impaired or have cognitive impairment to some degree, who used to be able to work with the old-fashioned materials which were more difficult to produce, more flexible in some ways, and more portable in others. Um, what we need to do is to focus people's attention enough to make sure that nobody gets left behind. And with that in mind, there's a question that I've been asking all um, projects that I can encounter, which is basically, how did you make your project more accessible? Um, I'm phrasing it as, what were the accessibility challenges, issues, and benefits of your project? And I'm asking people to identify in their reporting what they've done with respect to that. And if they're presenting slides, just one slide on that simple issue because it, by having to reflect on that, they will realise where they've accidentally left a group out. Just because they've optimised it for volume, for the number of students with the current issues, the current problems that they're dealing with, it just may be, especially in higher education, disabilities are dealt with on an ad hoc basis because there are theoretically so few of them. But once your materials go online, they definitely encounter people with disabilities who need a little bit of help. It's not that it's occasionally, it's a statistical issue where it's very rare for somebody who's visually impaired to meet this material because of the type of course and teaching. You know, we're in dentistry, we don't get blind dentists. But once you put your materials online, you will encounter somebody with a disability that needs a little bit of help. So that little bit of design or a different tactic can make it more available. And that led me to another question that I posted to Martin, uh, which is, in, in, what will be the role of the academic in this new connected environment with far fewer boundaries, because the disciplines can work together much more collaboratively? And who will promote those changes to make it a more accessible future? Will it be the students that demand as a group, you know, we need more help with this topic, and this academic is actually giving us more help, and therefore that academic or that institution gets more profile? Will that be the room? Will it be employers who say that your materials are helping more of our staff? Um, will it be parents who put pressure on universities now they can see how they teach because they can go through those boundaries? So how will this come about? So my angle, obviously, with my role in Tech This, is to promote accessibility just by changing practice, not by making it harder, and certainly not by bolt-on solutions. So that's my interest. Answer that. So, in my perspective, I'm going to put a sort of question to Amber. In the way most academics work now is sort of against the board. It's not against the board in the cool cash, like what the board way. It's in the our lawyers' disapproved way. And if you're doing a, a teaching economics, you'll grab a graph from the Economist or the BBC and you'll put it in your slideshow. And Sorry, Martin, can you speak up? Okay. <coughs> Saying so the way most academics work at the moment is uh, based on proprietary, non-open content. It, it's, it's strictly against the law. It's, uh, it's common to just take someone else's content, like um, a graph from the Economist, a news item slides, and a lot of academics don't understand why that is bad, or they um, uh, yeah they don't understand that, or they just take it's it as such a practice. Yeah. So um, and. And or they're using tools which are expensive tools which are not available to everyone else. And you can say, well, what's the alternative? The alternative I've found with Wikimedia UK is that um, we have open practice in every way. We work the way making the fly of this conference that the text are needed and people didn't anticipate that needed, but uh, uh, Creative Commons licensed by the foundation. The images, thank you, Amber, for Creative Commons licensing the image, but the images already existed and I already had the rights to reuse them and adapt them. Um, Scribus is free open source software where I can use I can buy desktop publishing software, but that free software enabled me to do that. So the tools and the content were free and available to anybody and for me to adapt. So that kind of openness were there, public making data available, we see in my Wikipedia of data. And you described a, a, a vision of the future for universities with, with open science, open education, how realistic and what time scale is it? Uh, what time scale? And, um, I think the starting point about the majority of practice is illegal does seem to be true, um, and understandably so, because as, as one of the speakers said earlier, uh, most academic practice with content has been just between them and the learners, 
and then sort of the turn of the century we've got a lot more um, PLEs, slightly higher risk because other staff could see it, maybe some other learners could see it, but then putting things out on the web, that, that is a, a huge impression of risk. And um, I like the way that Dave White from Oxford puts it about that, that this learning black market. And the reason that there's so much piracy is because the, the market, the supply chain is broken because people need much more granular pieces of content that they can reuse. There is a, there's an interesting project on, on that called Publisher We Are that we're funding at the University of Newcastle that's working with publishers on more granular permission seeking mechanisms. So it's working with Elsevier. Working with us <laughs> <laughs> um, on, on those more granular um, permission seeking. So what, one of the things there is um, maybe we'll find more the suppliers, the controllers of that copyright will find better business models that allow them to share those kind of things. But certainly the whole issue about risk is, is difficult and I'm very aware that in some institutions there's people who would do a lot more innovative work if they were A, off the radar of the institution, um, and, uh, and B, I guess there's, there's a question about how far the institution is taking the risk and how far individuals are taking the risk, and that's why quite often we're seeing really interesting work comes up when it's individuals taking that choice themselves. So it might be that the most interesting things happen on the margins, and it takes a while for institutions to catch up. Right. Very true. So, if, if they're more aware of Wikimedia and how Wikimedia works, then we, yeah. that may help. I wanted to put the question to Sarah. Um, so, you talked about Drawroom, which is this impressive archive which I've used and I've uploaded stuff to, and, you know, uh, and it's sort of part of the second, and um, activity actually monitoring more detail how things are used and appreciated, which we don't do. Really. But in the long run, do you see Joe and Wikimedia's competitors or, or collaborators or what? Do you see the relation? I really don't know. I mean, I have been looking at that today. Um, you hinted that, that maybe it doesn't matter where content is. It will be on the net, it's on the internet, and then it's tracking. I think Joe um, and particularly clarified our business over the last couple of years, um, so we had to, because we wanted to be a proper service, not just a service and development. And I think our business case, um, a lot of it is around cost saving across the sector and providing centre of expertise um, for higher and further education institutions at that level to have a place where they know they can safely both store educational content and um, expose it to the world through the window of Durham as a, as a sort of prestige and reputation kind of thing. Um, but because there's so many things that we don't know how we're going to look in five years, because we know the rate at which technology changes, whether a Joram is needed or even other media is needed in five years, we don't know. So I have to say it's not a fear of mine. I don't feel like with media as a competitor. I feel like it's got, I'm quite sort of narrowed this down here, but I feel like it's got a slightly different business case. Um, it works on different levels and in different ways, and it certainly enriches the whole environment. And I would just hope that you think that we enrich the environment at the moment as well. Uh, and to, quite honestly, I always just want what's best. For about 10 years from now, there's no Joram, and Wikimedia is taking over the world. That would be fine with me if Wikimedia was doing its job right. That's a really bold thing to say. Thank you very much. <laughs> um, don't tell Jack that I said that. Tell the funders to be prepared to see the project. It's just been tweeted. Um, Sorry, it's been tweeted. It's, 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 it's been the official uh, university sector um, gateway. It could have an end of prestige and it could have things that would be guaranteed to have come from academia. So the next question is if the, the review processes within Wikimedia, the review, featured review processes from Wikipedia, which are very demanding, and some people say it's more demanding than the, the equivalent academic review process. If something's created and it's an open source and it's been through a demanding review, would you, would you focus on a highlight or make that searchable within the job? Um, we already kind of do that in our featured resources. Um, it's worth looking at our front page because we've just got, we, we do we feature different resources each month and we've just put some up for um, September which are absolutely fantastic, the creative arts 
uh, teaching resources, and they include stuff from the Salem Foundation in the US, uh, Process Apps, which is an amazing, innovative open education, education resource here in the UK, um, an interactive content package resource that is about color and seeing different colors and knowing about color and so forth. And every time we do that, every time we feature resources, those resources get their views and their downloads go to the roof of that month as people tweet them and go look at them and so on. Now, we really just do that at the moment according to whatever basis we think. For instance, in October, um, we know that October is Black History Month. We're actually thinking we'd like to feature OERs around topics um, of interest to black and minority ethnic um, communities or in subject areas around that and so on. So we're, we're starting to think a bit more ahead about what we do, but it's not about so much sitting down saying we're going to peer review all the resources and then the top ones get featured. It's more about focusing from different angles. But if some other place like Wikiversity mm -hmm. has a review process and <coughs> anything anybody can in about this on review, would you consider showcasing that in this sort of feature prestige? Of course, if, if you put link, a link to it in the drawer, I mean, you could just link to things from Jorum as well as. Should I ask the audience to ask those questions, or do you want to follow well, up to them? I'm just, uh, I'm just having a thought about something that might be useful to explain to Wikipedians about OER and what this whole OER uh, field is. And, and I'm just imagining something. What I'm imagining is that you might go looking for a good instructional open resource and can't find one that's sort of definitive. I thought it might be worth explaining a bit about um, that, uh, what you could describe as three different routes to producing OER. So um, one of them might be just it's as is, that it's the content that has been used in the classroom, and that's been designed for known cohorts, known, and that comes back to Terry's point about accessibility. Um, so, and that's sometimes called OER exhaust, so that's the stuff that comes out of the teaching process as a byproduct. You also might get stuff that has been used in teaching and then is uh, sort of decontextualised, you take some of the context out so it's more generally useful. That's the kind of thing that might be quite good to, to point to Wikipedia as a, a sort of um, context-less or reduced context kind of um, uh, piece. And then there's some OER that is designed from scratch. And I think that that stuff where it's designed from scratch because there's a theme of need, that's where the OER community could really link up with Wikipedia and have a much clearer idea about where the gaps might be, where instruction materials would help. Mm. Just, we're just saying an example then from the publisher project. Um, so the Royal Brentley College and Nottingham were also involved in it. That was my way. Awesome, um, of course. <laughs> an example there is um, one of the, uh, we are creating a, a mashup of content from Elsevier. So they provided some images, some text. Um, we then uh, change that and incorporate that into a short lecture. And then that whole resource is released as an open educational resource. Um, yeah, and it's those kind of things that are custom designed to meet a particular need, designed for general reuse, that um, might be the most the best for Wikipedia people to meet it. Audience, ask us stuff. Yeah, I mean, one of the things we've um, obviously touched on quite a bit today is about quality assurance peer review of, of uh, Wikipedia, which I think is uh, very strong. I wonder with, with Durham, Sarah, I mean, how do you ensure the quality of the OERs that you put onto Durham? And how is I, as an educator coming into the site, can be reassured that that is particularly valuable for my teaching and it's of the quality of, if I don't know that that's produced it, that it's good enough for me? That's a good question. Um, we don't take any responsibility for that. We are a sharing platform. So anybody that works in UK higher and further education therefore has a shibboleth account through their email address can upload their content to join. They have to assign a Creative Commons license. We don't check anything. Um, there's certainly guidelines available for people. Um, they can certainly email us and ask, am I really allowed to put this up here? I don't know if this image is, etc. Um, but what we're doing is we're trusting the academic community to put stuff up that they feel is of sufficient quality because they're working in the sector. Um, and then we trust the users to go and look and scan through what's there and decide what works for them. So it's quite, 
it's a bit more radical in a way than what we first visited Jordan being 10, 12 years ago. I was, I've been involved in Jordan in one capacity or another from the start, and there are all kinds of anxieties then about peer review, and there should be a workload, and it goes through, and someone checks it, and all that. And we, we've just thrown all that out and gone, right, you know, it's up to the community to decide. Um, well, I'd, I'd like to pick up on that point because mm -hmm. what we need is for management in education institutions to recognise the value of good deposit into job so that somebody, in, as part of their professional standards in their promotion criteria, actually making good deposits that are used from Jura, or just making the deposit into Jura, gets recognised. Yeah. Yeah, or anywhere else, yes, okay, or anywhere else. I'm just picking up on the, on the Jura context. But, but we need that, that, that those who actually produce evidence of sharing good educational material, which improves the brand of their institution, Clearly that needs to be recognised and there's a fair amount of digital scholarship involved in finding the best resources out there on the internet and integrating them into the teaching successfully so that they liberate more time to do tutorials or whatever specific academic speciality they want to engage with, with their students. So we need to recognise that as part of the loop. And the problem is that the higher tiers may be a bit techno-reluctant and have not engaged with the potential of Wikimedia and the potential of Joram, so we've got to promote that to get recognised, which will then in turn improve the quality of the deposits. Um, can, can I just, bring in another, uh, sorry, just, another question? Oh, okay, yeah. sorry. just to say, and this is where the other stuff I was talking about, about actually making the data available, is, the, is linking up with the quality thing. We're using the data to show that the community thinks this one and this one and this one is quality rather than us saying it. Thanks for that, Terry. You can have a job with us. Laurie, at the back, <laughs> has a question. Another just program manager who needs to be Terry, you're just making that point about the about management. Surely it's not about management in institutions putting that kind of pressure on. Surely we should be putting management on people responsible for the UK PSF and maybe okay. the professional standards and integrating at that level okay. rather than doing it on an institution by institution. Otherwise, it's just going to be piecemeal. Well, I have actually also had discussions about the UK PSF taking advantage of the network of opportunities like Sorry, UK PSF is the UK Professional Standards Framework, which has been offered by the Higher Education Academy. And digital scholarship is... Not just the academy. Uh, sorry, I'm just... <laughs> <laughs> so, I'm, as, as, as far as I know, yeah, it's owned by the sector, it's not an AG Academy thing, is it? The sector owns the framework. Okay, the sector owns it, but it's been initially promoted by the Higher Education Academy into the ownership of the sector, which then will in turn exchange how they've implemented it because they're not restricted on how they implement the framework. The digital aspects of digital scholarship, obviously including accessibility, and any other deposit standards and educational standards need to be recognised. But the problem is it takes time for this to hit the promotion criteria. And unfortunately, in the current environment, many academics are having to fight for their individual lives by raising their profile in their institution. And sometimes that means they've had to reinvent the wheel when they know there was a perfectly good wheel out there. Well, I just had a hand yeah, I just to get back to the just been revised in the last six months mm. and there isn't anything about OER or accessibility. Is that, how is that possible when an HEA had OER needs there in place? Well, so I, that's my question because yeah, unless it's in the PSF, management are not going to think that it's important. When I inquired about this, it's because it's a framework and therefore they expect the institution itself to implement that element within the framework itself in the way it wants to. It's up to the institution how they do that. Um, I think, you know, the, the, the thinking behind it is it's fairly obvious that it should be done, whether or not it happens that way or not. Roger? I wanted to pick up on this um, point about um, making a pretty pressure. Because um, one of the things that we're failing to talk about is money. Um, because we're all talking about things being open and educate education. But things like Wikipedia, for instance, is probably the prime educational resource, or one of the primary resources in England. We don't get that kind of profile. In Wales, it definitely is the prime educational resource that schools are using. 450 million users here, 2.5 million in, in Wales. Um, I went, just name dropping, we went to talk to the Education Minister for Wales. He has regular meetings with Microsoft. 
He had regular meetings with El Sevier. He doesn't know, he never meets Wikipedia because we don't ask for any money. Because we give all this stuff for nothing. So organisations like GIS have got all these millions of pounds which they're giving out in competitions to people who are bidding. Why would we go and talk to them? We don't need their money. So we've got a disconnect between the people who are trying to run this and the people who are actually supplying the resource and how we join those together because we're both trying to achieve the same thing but you're missing out on a big opportunity. I, from, from the point of view of JIS, uh, I certainly I, I strongly agree with that, that we've been quite constrained by who we can fund. And um, one of the real opportunities of JISC is, is changing the way that it's funded and the way that therefore it can fund is to be able to work in partnership with other not for profit organisations. Uh, that has been difficult and hopefully that will be easier in the future. I'm, I'm prejudiced against John because he was nicked a question earlier. I'll come to Doug and then John. <laughs> um, so I'm from Brazil and we've been doing lots of stuff around kind of the architecture of participation. Um, and in fact, next week we'll be doing lots about that. Um, and it seems to me, because I used to teach kind of history and things, and all the, I never, it was kind of before OER kind of took off and stuff, and it was in schools rather than higher education. But it seems to me that the, the stuff that I use and everyone else used and everyone I kind of come across in, in HE in my limited experience have used is to do with they know the other person. I don't know many examples, and perhaps it's just my experience, I don't know many examples of people using a resource without having any clue about who made it in their particular context. And I just wondered to what extent we're perhaps approaching it from a technical angle when actually it's about human relationships. Can you speak to that? Cause <laughs> Uh, the surprising thing about Wikipedia is it's not new technology, it's really old technology. And uh, it's, it's cultural innovation, not technical innovation. And there's lots of things which have the same software, software platform as Wikipedia, but don't have anything like success. And I do encounter sort of brought into a project in higher education saying, um, oh, there's limited term funding for this particular project, but it continue because it'd be like Wikipedia, people would just volunteer. And, tell you. and then you ask, well, is it open content that people contributing to the public good? No. So uh, they just assume it's some magic that you could install, you just install software that makes Wikipedia-like things happen. And people have got to actually make the cultural change. Like we were saying earlier about education, that um, uh, collaborating to write your student essay, where, where you have strangers commenting on it, that's actually the good thing. That's like you've got to change the uh, attitudes of that being the education you aim for. I brought up a picture in my head of a wiki graveyard of certainly all the projects I've seen that start at the wiki and then it was self-sustaining and everyone will keep contributing and they don't because it, take, it takes a much more of a critical mass and much more nurturing to do that but um, what you say about uh, individual identities is what makes me think about there's a huge urgency about that in terms of how we manage our research and our research outputs in universities in the UK because the research funding structure is changing so radically and uh, one of the things that is being invested in quite heavily is researcher IDs. So individual identities for researchers. And part of the reason is that it's recognised that that is the way that people make connections. That's where, that's how people judge provenance, is who something is by. So I absolutely agree that we need to be um, managing the network of identities better because that is a key part of the way that people navigate resources. And I, I can be forgiven in this forum and no other, but I mean, if the researchers create their papers in a wiki, then every individual contribution will be tracked. Yeah. That's one way to... Um, yeah, micro-attribution, get what everybody's uh, exact <laughs> contribution. Yeah. And there's really uh, interesting things like my experiment, which is a collaborative experimental platform, so, as in doing experiments for scientists, which use the same kind of wiki logic, but it's based around uh, scientific experiment structures. Do you have one more question? I realise we've got to go away and change things. I'm sort of lovely. Thank you. Um, so I've just got one thing I want to tell you, and then I'll ask for a question. There's a guy who's 15 who just invented a new pancreatic cancer test by Googling, which is just amazing. Um, so I have a friend who teaches medical students, and this is kind of links the cost and the trust of people who publish. Um, he knows his medical students can't afford all the textbooks, so he recommends textbooks that are very easy to find online on certain sites. <laughs> um, and that's his workaround at the moment, because he doesn't know 
the good open education resources and he doesn't trust them enough because they're not from the names that, you know. Yeah, it could be um, going to Wikibooks as well. Yeah. And that's very useful because electronic books are far more accessible and therefore students can render them in the style that they prefer. Um, we're working with publishers to try and get um, to enable all students to get an e-copy of any textbook that's set and encouraging academic staff to set textbooks that can be made available online easily. And there are pr protocols in place and I think that the best turnaround we've had is half an hour for the student to get something through a request from a library, an e-print copy made available to them. So we, we see more, more interest in that way. And that links, of course, into the Wikimedia project mentioned earlier, where you're turning things into Wikibooks, because then it can be rendered in a different way, and if you know how to use your PDF tools, you can have it read out to you, or you can have it zoomed and reflowed and so on. So there are ways to make Wikipedia more accessible. I said what I've learned from today is I've tried to keep opening up research and opening up education with separate things. But we've come up against open research and tear down the firewalls again and again. And it is integral education. Can somebody follow the reference? Um, well, it depends whether it's an open access way to it. Um, and uh, so Wikimedia UK, we're, we're explicitly open education and we're not a politically campaigning organisation. We have to work in whatever legal environment we're in. But actually, the academic space is part of the, the movement we're doing, tear down the firewalls, which we individually campaign for. Any final social response to yeah. Thanks, everybody. That's been the first day of Eddie Wiki. Uh, we start, is it, uh, it's 9.30 tomorrow, with our second day keynote from Amber. Um, I'll be rumbling in the jungle with funny chisk and I've made an infographic. <laughs> <laughs>